June 12, 1994. Nicole Brown Simpson appears to have it all. Beauty, health, money, and two adorable kids. She's living the Hollywood dream. She was a diamonds and pearls kind of girl, but very spiritual. Always brought a smile on your face. For seven years, she was married to football hero O.J. Simpson. O.J. really did worship her. I mean, really did. But, you know, a trophy wife, yes. But behind that trophy wife image lurked an ugly secret. I can't believe anybody would hit a, a woman like that. She's terrible. Her dream will soon be shattered. And a bizarre freeway chase will lead O.J. Simpson into a courtroom media frenzy. This is the last 24 hours in the life of Nicole Brown Simpson. Los Angeles, California. June 11th, 1994. It's 10.40 p.m. and Nicole Brown Simpson is sleeping at home at 875 South Bundy Drive. For the last year, she's been living here in affluent Brentwood with her children, Sydney and Justin. It's been two years since she divorced her husband, football great O.J. Simpson. And in just 24 hours, she'll be dead. The next morning at 6.30, Nicole Brown Simpson is already up. A fitness fanatic, the 35-year-old hits the pavement for an early morning run. It's a ritual familiar to her sister, Tanya. Well, it's the in thing to do in, in California. You gotta look good, gotta be in shape. Um, but yeah, she was running like nine miles a day. I don't know how she did it, but yeah, she, she was in shape. Meanwhile, less than 10 miles away at the Riviera Country Club, her famous ex-husband, O.J. Simpson, the retired football star and media celebrity, is also getting his early morning exercise. In his case, it's teeing off with his Hollywood cronies. Golf is now his major sporting passion. And tonight, he's set to fly to Chicago to host a celebrity golf tournament for Hertz Rent-A-Car, the company that keeps him in the multi-millionaire bracket. After seven years of marriage, Nicole Brown Simpson is just getting used to the single life. Someone who knew her well at the time is neighbor, Ron Hardy. I met Nick uh, through some mutual friends and um, just a long story short, just ended up moving really about 200 yards in the proximity of where Bundy was and um, spent an awful lot of time with her and the kids and, and we had very, very mutual friends and we were always doing things socially. I think that she had discovered independence. She hadn't had, at that point, a whole lot of men that were very nice to her, other than her friends, and she wasn't allowed to really have those, you know, per se. But I really think that she um, started to come into her own and realize that, you know, she had something to say, and people would listen to what she had to say rather than being told what to say. Like every divorcee, she just wanted to have fun, you know? And she, she had fun with her friends, the sisters, we all had fun. <laughs> And fun was the driving force behind her very first meeting with O.J. Simpson. Back in 1977, Nicole Brown was working at an upscale Hollywood club when in walked the man she would marry. The meeting was electric. It was love at first sight with those two. It was just chemistry. Although O.J. Simpson was a household name, the young, naive Nicole, who knew little about football, had only a sketchy idea of who he actually was. To most of America, the man known as The Juice was both a sports legend and a Hollywood star. 
He was part of the scene. And because Hollywood idolizes jocks, the way jocks idolize Hollywood. And so it's not a surprise that O.J. would get uh, connected with the Hollywood crowd. The juice returned to the restaurant often, determined to win over the beautiful Nicole. She sought the advice of David Lebon, an old friend with whom she was sharing an apartment. I can remember her coming home and said, oh, there's this football player, he wants to ask me out. And I said, oh, what's his name? This is O.J. Simpson. I said, oh, you're kidding. You know, because I know, you know, he's a famous running back and he's a fantastic football player. In the game of seduction, Nicole was clearly outmatched. He was 30, she was 18. He was a star, she worked in a restaurant. He was a multimillionaire, she was broke. And OJ's persistence paid off. I think she got home at two o'clock and I said, you know, what, where have you been? He says, oh, we had a great date. And I can remember he picked me up in the uh, black Rolls Royce and his Rolls said Juice, you know, and that was his nickname. And, um, I, and then all of a sudden I looked and her pants had been ripped. And I said, well, what happened? She said, well, he just was a little forceful and he ripped my pants. I said, you're kidding. Why would you let him do that? I was kind of upset and I said, I want to talk to him. I want to, you know, and she goes, no, I think I like him. However, from the start, it was no fairy tale. O.J. Simpson outmatched Nicole in one other important way. He was married with two children. What's more, his wife, Marguerite, was pregnant with a third. But that didn't stop Nicole. Neither did O.J.'s jealous request that she immediately vacate her male roommate's apartment. She said to her, I don't want you living with anybody, even though I was, you know, completely a platonic, a friend and everything. And um, from there, he got her apartment. He seemed possessive, but not too overwhelming at that time. Later on, he seemed like he was more and more possessive and more and more jealous. Jealousy will eventually tear Nicole and O.J. apart. And it will mark O.J. Simpson as the prime suspect in a crime that will unleash a media circus. June 12th, 1994, Los Angeles. It's 10.40 a.m. and Nicole Brown Simpson has only 12 hours to live. As usual, her life centers on her kids. She would do anything and everything for those two kids. And she was just, she was a kid herself. She spends the morning buying them toys. At a florist's, she buys a bouquet to brighten up the house. She also picks some yellow roses for her daughter, Sydney, who, this evening, is performing at her school's dance recital. The healthy alimony payment she receives from O.J. Simpson allow her to live the life of the rich and famous, like the rest of her neighbors in posh Brentwood, California. Shopping sprees and Ferraris, however, are a long way from Nicole's modest roots. The second of four daughters, she was born in 1959, not in America, but in Frankfurt, Germany, to Lou Brown, an American serviceman, and Judith Bauer, his German wife. In 1963, when Nicole was four, the family moved to California, to the booming shores of Orange County. She was a little surf rat. She, you know, we grew up on the beach, and she, we always had, uh, she had her own little surfboard, and we have great surfing where we, where we grew up. Nicole and Denise were closest in age, and in high school, the two sisters were the picture-perfect image of the beautiful California girl. People were captivated by these two, and uh, yeah, they were both homecoming princesses, and everybody knew Nicole and Denise. Nicole, the homecoming princess, attended Dana Hills High School, and in 1976, she was thinking about a career. One of her teachers was Bill Prestridge. Well, it was in my journalism class, and we were all talking about what kids wanted to do for careers. And uh, it came to Nicole, 
And I can remember this because Nicole said to the class that she wanted to marry somebody wealthy. And the whole class kind of froze and we kind of looked at each other and, and I said, well, Nicole, that's not really a job. She was going to Danny Hills High School when I met her and um, uh, we just, I would come down probably other, every other weekend so I could photograph her because I needed to do school projects for photography school. And her and Denise, were the, you know, we would do pictures and they were the most beautiful women that, you know, you've ever seen. I mean, they were just stunning. She also showed flashes of creative talent behind the camera and impressed her old friend, David Lebon. After high school, um, she wanted to be a photographer like myself. So I would teach her the camera and a lot of things about, you know, and show her the f-stops and show her the shutter speeds and teach her all about the camera. I said, well, why don't you think about going to photography school? She was a fantastic photographer. She always had the best camera. She always knew, you know, where the best light was. And she was just very savvy at it. But instead of moving 100 miles north to take the photography course, Nicole followed David LeBon to Los Angeles in search of a job and moved in with him to split the expenses. It was completely platonic. She, um, I remember it was, a, it was a studio apartment. That's all I could afford. And um, she would sleep on the bed, and I slept on the floor with, um, um, I can remember I had a sleeping bag. Her dazzling good looks trumped any other talent she may have had and led to a job as a hostess at the Daisy, an upscale Beverly Hills club, where she greeted the stars and would meet O.J. Simpson. The Daisy was a private club and a movie star hangout, and um, everybody, who was everybody, would go there. When The Juice first set eyes on the new hostess at the Daisy, he was a household name, but his football career was almost over, and so was his marriage to Marguerite. I was having problems in my marriage, uh, and I'm, I was married to a very good person, but uh, you would think we had healthy kids, you would think we had money, you would think uh, fame, that uh, how could there be problems? But unfortunately, um, um, money and fame uh, is no cure-all for, um, um, I guess, personal understanding. After a three-year affair with Nicole, O.J. Simpson finally divorced his first wife. In February 1985, he married the homecoming princess in a ceremony at his Rockingham mansion. We were invited and it was great. I took pictures. I took tons and tons of pictures of the wedding and it was, it was just fabulous. What a blast. It was a great time. You know when you go to a wedding and you know everybody, you know it's a great party. They set up house at the Rockingham mansion and by 1988, they had two children, a girl, Sydney, and a boy, Justin. They were the very image of wedded bliss. OJ, the football legend, loved to be seen with sexy Nicole on his arm. For her part, Nicole was living the Hollywood dream, and she took to it like a duck to water. The thing she liked it about it was the going to charity functions, meeting a lot of these stars that they'd run into and all the people with money. She didn't turn out to be one of these celebrity wives that would just go out and really want to be in the limelight. She did. She was not that type of girl. Sure, she did the Hollywood glam scene, but really you would never see Nicole without her flip-flop. She was always in shorts. Um, she was, a, I call her a, um, an elegant, glamorous hippie chick. You know, she, you, she was a diamonds and pearls kind of girl, but very spiritual. Always brought a smile on your face. You were down, she was there to lift you up. By 1988, she had a $5 million mansion surrounded by the cream of Hollywood. She had a condo in New York, a $2 million seafront house at Laguna Beach. Well, it was a beach house. Sure, it was nice furniture and stuff, but it was just kids, beach, sand, chewing gum, bathing suits, shorts, flip-flops, you know, just that's who she was. And of course, his and her Ferraris. She had this Ferrari. It was a beach car, we would take it down to the beach, so it's not that she disrespected things, but she just didn't care. And the good life was punctuated by endless vacations, often with her sisters in tow. 
Oh gosh, we would go skiing, we went to Hawaii together. I would take care of the kids sometimes and we'd go to New York together. It was just, there were happy times. It wasn't, it wasn't all bad. Just like a lot of the victims, it's not always all bad. And um, just unfortunately when it was bad, it was bad. Behind the cars, the vacations and the luxurious properties lay a fatal flaw in Nicole's seemingly perfect marriage. OJ's volatile temper. Tormented by jealousy, the football legend frequently flew into rages. But Nicole was feisty and stood her ground. Nicole was interesting. She could um, just push his buttons. And actually, he could go off. Unfortunately, if I would have known more about it today, I mean, looking back at it, <laughs> you know. I would have changed some things if I could. I, you know, it's really... Uh, O.J. is a very, very, very controlling person. He it was always about O.J. It was always O.J. this, O.J. that. I mean, that's just how he was. Not knowing what to do, Nicole turned to therapist Dr. Susan Forward. Nicole was a very complex woman. The situation was a very complex situation. When you're married to a superstar who's making tons of money and um, there's a glamorous lifestyle, the benefits were such that she didn't see the reason to uh, leave. They always hope it's going to get better. I didn't see anything bad. I, all I saw was the good because victims of domestic violence, they keep it very quiet. Now, they don't tell anybody what's going on. They, um, so when this whole thing happened, yeah, I was in disbelief. And I didn't even know what this domestic violence stuff was until, until this happened. Long before they were married, Nicole was jolted by the violence of OJ's dark side. During an argument, he smashed the windshield of their Mercedes. Being a football player, I think there was some, probably still some violence in him. There is a huge amount of domestic violence with professional athletes, huge, especially football players, because they live in a violent world, and they are besieged by women. They get the idea that they're really hot stuff, and they can do anything they want to do. He did have a collection of knives, and when he found out that was one of her fears, he would use that against her. My wife told me that Nicole talked about being, being worried, concerned that OJ said that he was going to slice her up. The ongoing fights escalated, and Nicole was so afraid that she called the police. Very soon, they'll be called for the last time to investigate a brutal double murder. June 12th, 1994, 11.30 a.m., Los Angeles. Nicole Brown Simpson has spent the morning shopping for her kids. She's bought a dozen yellow roses for her daughter, Sydney, who tonight will be performing at a recital. It will be the last time she will see her eight-year-old daughter dance. In 11 hours, Nicole Brown Simpson will be dead. Less than 10 miles away, after his round of golf, her ex-husband, O.J. Simpson, plays a leisurely game of gin rummy at his country club with his Hollywood friends. Later, Simpson would say that he was killing time before attending Sydney's dance rehearsal and then catching a flight to Chicago. It's a long way from brawling in San Francisco's housing projects where Simpson was born in 1947. Orenthal James Simpson hated his name. Even as a child, he was known as O.J., or, inevitably, The Juice, a name that stuck with him throughout his football years. His family was poor, and because of a lack of vitamins in his diet, young O.J. suffered from rickets, which, ironically, forced the future all-star running back to wear a corrective leg brace in his childhood years. As a teen, he often got into street fights, and did time in a juvenile detention center. But young OJ was determined to become a somebody.
one of the things I wanted most as a kid growing in, up in the ghetto was not money, it was fame. I wanted to be known. I wanted the people to say, hey, there goes, uh, you know, OJ. Right from the starting line, he got what he wanted because of a single raw talent. He could run like mad. I, one, he ran on, uh, at, U at USC, he ran on a world record 400 meter relay team. That's how fast he was. Oh, I met him uh, basically in the mid 1960s when he played for City College of San Francisco and where he started getting his rave notices. And then after he came down to USC, you give him the ball and he'd get two yards, you get two yards, you get four yards, then he'd get 45 yards. He was amazing. He was just a great, great running back. By 1969, the 22-year-old Simpson was the number one NFL draft pick and signed with the Buffalo Bills for $350,000, a huge sum at the time. He cracked one record after another. The most rushing yards gained in a season, the most rushing yards in a single game, most touchdowns in a season. But OJ also had a second gift. He could charm the devil. And that charm led to work in front of the camera and plunged OJ into the strange world of celebrity. And the poor boy from San Francisco couldn't get enough. There isn't a great athlete who's not egotistical. You have to be. So egotistical, in fact, that he was driven to win even the friendliest of games. I think he probably fudged on his card a little bit. But I wasn't the greatest golfer in the world, and I didn't have to, I didn't fudge. He would always have to win at Monopoly. He, you know, just anything. He had to win, no matter what it was. He was the winner. And it was whenever we went out somewhere, he, it had to be about OJ. And that's the way these people think. I'm special. And, uh, and, from the, and from the time athletes, great athletes, are about seven or eight years old, people kiss their behind because everybody wants to be associated with a winner. And so the little peccadilloes start getting larger. And the kid has learned I can get away with anything. So why shouldn't he think that way when he gets older? For Simpson, getting away with it became a way of life. Not just at play with his pals, but also at home. In the early hours of New Year's Day 1989, his four-year marriage to Nicole hit a new and violent low. Answering yet another domestic disturbance call, police arrived at OJ's mansion. They rang the buzzer outside the gate, but the housekeeper refused to let them in. Meanwhile, Nicole ran out of the bushes half-dressed, yelling at the cops that Simpson was trying to kill her. I'm in the business of changing people, and I do a pretty good job of it. But I'll tell you, any batterer, they have a Swiss cheese conscience, you know, with great big holes in it. And um, as a result, there is no moral compass. I remember I actually heard on the news about him being arrested and her um, having him arrested at the house. And um, I just was so upset. I just. And I think that's really the first time that I knew that, you know, you got to watch out. I mean, he's an abusive husband and, and... O.J. Simpson was charged with assaulting Nicole and pleaded no contest to a misdemeanor. He was ordered to take psychological counseling. Oh, that was a joke. Some friend of theirs did some sessions on the telephone with him, and I think it may have been all of two or three. With every police call, O.J. Simpson was leaving a wide trail of circumstantial evidence, all pointing to a man who was unpredictable and violent. The pattern was always the same. Nicole would always forgive him, and O.J. would always do it again. The cycle is very traditional. There's a period of calm. The woman thinks maybe he's changed. Something happens, she says something, she does something, he doesn't like it. All, it doesn't take much to trigger the rage, and the next thing, he's acting out the rage with the beatings. Then he does what I call a phony remorse. 
I love you. Don't leave me. I can't live without you. It'll never happen again, I swear. And she believes him. And then it starts all over again. But finally, in 1992, after seven years of marriage, Nicole had had enough and divorced O.J. Simpson. It was New Year's Eve, 1992, and she, we were at Spago's, and she said, come on, let's go to the bathroom. And I said, all right. She said, I'm asking for a divorce tonight. But that didn't end the violence. On October 25th, 1993, less than a year before her death, O.J.'s rage was finally caught on tape when Nicole called 911. Just five days before Nicole's murder, a worker at a women's shelter received a call from a woman who gave only the name of Nicole. She reported that the woman was in dire fear for her life. Still victim to the cycle of abuse, Nicole kept seeing O.J. Simpson even after the divorce. But now, wise to the legal system, she was storing pictures of her cuts and bruises in a safety deposit box. Denise would take pictures of her face and her bruises so they could have proof of the abuse so she could get the child have the children because she was worried about her her children and if you ever saw those pictures it was terrible I mean he really really I was so upset at that I just you know I can't believe anybody would hit a, a woman like that it's just terrible June 12, 1994. At exactly 2.18 p.m., O.J. Simpson calls his ex-wife from his country club. A waitress working at the club would report that O.J. was engaged in a shouting match on the telephone. In just over eight hours, Nicole will be killed. This phone call along with others made on that day by O.J., Nicole and her family, will help establish a timeline that will become increasingly important in the double murder investigation that's yet to come. June 12th, 1994, 4.40 p.m., Paul Revere High School in Brentwood, California. Nicole Brown Simpson sits with her mother, Judithah, and her two sisters, Dominique and Denise. Nicole has only six hours to live. O.J. Simpson arrives soon after and sits behind the Brown family. Nicole pointedly ignores him, and with good reason. In the last few days, her ex-husband has threatened to report her to the IRS for not disclosing the sale of a property. It would force Nicole to move out of her present house to avoid a large tax payment. Two years earlier, after being granted a divorce from OJ, Nicole had truly thought she could start her life anew, free from OJ's interference. In January 1992, she moved out to a rented house. She was later awarded a cash settlement of almost half a million dollars, as well as 10,000 a month for child support. She also kept the Ferrari. I think that there was a, a growing period. She started sort of putting things together a little bit more. I mean, she realized that, you know, the lifestyle that she'd had and, and the, uh, you know, the, the privilege that was there was not I don't think is as important to her as it was, once was. And, but there's still the reality of, OK, what am I going to do? And you know, she made time for herself, but it was, it was never at the expense of the children. Nicole hadn't been truly single since she was 18. Now, no longer the trophy wife, 
she was discovering a whole new life with the opposite sex. I don't even remember her ever going, I'm going on a date. I mean, she spent time with guys. I mean, she was fascinated by, like I said before, men that were, were nice to her and that would, you know, ask her a question and wait for her to finish the sentence. Yeah, she flirted and she, she you know, goofed around just like the rest of us because she hadn't done that in a very, very long time. Even though O.J. Simpson had found a new life and a new girlfriend, he wasn't happy with the way Nicole was living her new life. When she did want to date somebody and he found out, I think he was, you know, he was probably pretty upset about it. By the time of the dance recital, Nicole's anger is red hot because of OJ's threat to report her to the IRS. She refuses to acknowledge he's even there. He was rejected uh, at the daughter's dance recital. You can't reject an obsessor. They just, uh, that's when whatever demons they have really kick in. Later, at 6.40 p.m., following Sydney's dance recital, Nicole and her family celebrate at the Mezza Luna restaurant, where she's a regular. Mezza Luna was a neighborhood uh, Italian restaurant, uh, very casual. 25-year-old waiter Ron Goldman greets and chats with Nicole and her family. They're casual friends. But in just four hours, the handsome, aspiring actor will become the second victim of a brutal double homicide. Waitress Tia Gavin was also working the tables that night. Ron Goldman and I discussed, he, you know, we looked at the reservation book, which you do, to see what to expect and what to get ready for. And uh, he said, oh, I know these people. I'd rather not wait on, on them because I know them. And it's not fun to wait on people you know. And so I was more than pleased to take a nice big table like that. Nicole orders spinach and cheese rigatoni and a bottle of good Chianti. The meal is festive. But four hours before her death, Nicole makes a startling confession about O.J. Simpson to her mother. You know, the night that she died, my mom said she leaned over to me and said, he will always be my soulmate. After everything that she had endured, he will always be my soulmate. So, yeah. So it was, it, they just, they had something. And that something was co-obsession. Not just one person is obsessed, but the other person is as well. And there's a rejection and a coming back together, and a rejection and a coming back together. And I think that that's probably what was going on here. At around 8.40 p.m., Nicole pays the check. She has just two hours left to live. I think they all pretty much got up and left around the same time. Um, they might have been saying goodbye to each other outside the front door as, you know, the one family went off in one direction. Detective Tom Lang headed the homicide investigation and would later piece together the chain of events. After dinner, they strolled across the street. Um, uh, Nicole's mother and father, uh, Lou and, and Judith, uh, left the restaurant and got into their car and, and drove away, unbeknownst to uh, Judith at the time she dropped her glasses in the gutter. After leaving the Metzaluna restaurant, Nicole, Justin, Sydney, and Sydney's friend go for ice cream. They then head back to Nicole's townhouse, where Sydney's friend is picked up by her mother and goes home. For the kids, it's the end of a wonderful day. At the same time, O.J. Simpson and actor Kato Kalin, who lives rent-free in Simpson's guesthouse, take Simpson's Bentley to pick up some food. The ex-football star orders a burger and Kaylin opts for the chicken sandwich with fries. They drive back to Simpson's Rockingham house with OJ munching the burger and Kaylin saving his meal to eat at home. Half an hour later, Nicole receives a call from a friend who's three days into drug rehab. She puts the kids to bed 
and receives another phone call, this time from her mother. Phone records show 9.42 p.m. Uh, Judith had called Nicole and said, hey, I think I lost my glasses at the restaurant. Could you see if you could get them back? The prosecution would later claim that this tiniest of accidents would lead waiter Ron Goldman to his murder. June 12, 1994, Los Angeles, California. It's roughly 10 p.m. Earlier, Nicole Brown Simpson's mother, Judith, had accidentally dropped her glasses as she left a restaurant with her family. Nicole phones the Metzaluna, where waiter Ron Goldman tells her they've been found. Ron said, you know, I know I'm, I'm friends with Nicole. I know where she lives. I can drop him off at her house when I go home. My understanding was that they were um, casual friends. Um, I'm sure I wouldn't be so at least a bit surprised if he would have wanted it to be more. Um, but the general feeling from those who knew him was that it had not been more than friendship. In less than one hour, both will be found dead. Just all the events that led up to what happened were absolutely 100% harmless, no matter what stories were spun out. I mean, he was just being a good guy. At the same time, at 10.03 p.m., Simpson is busy trying to reach his girlfriend, but there's no answer, and he leaves no message. <laughs> Meanwhile, in her home on South Bundy Drive, Nicole runs the bath, lights candles, and creates a relaxing atmosphere. For his part, Ron Goldman is wrapping things up at the Metzaluna. He spoke with the bartender a little bit, and then eventually left before I did, because I was the closing waiter of the, the night. Goldman heads home to change out of his waiter's uniform. He borrows a friend's car and drives to Nicole's with her mother's glasses. The front door of the residence was wide open. The light was on, the porch light was on. Nicole was not wearing any shoes, so she was no doubt expecting him to show up there with the glasses. But something went terribly wrong. Although records show that at 10.30 p.m., a man and woman walk past Nicole's townhouse and see nothing strange, only 10 minutes later, all hell breaks loose. The evidence gives us two or three scenarios. He may have confronted a Goldman. Goldman may have become um, uh, uh, confrontational with him. You know, what are you doing? We don't know, OK? We just know that the, a witness heard uh, somebody yelling around the time that this occurred from an alley across the street, about 250 feet east of there. Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson are brutally attacked by an unknown killer, or killers. Two victims are left dead in a pool of blood outside the house, carved up with a knife. The bodies are covered in stab wounds. Nicole's head is barely left attached. 20 minutes earlier, at 10.20 p.m., a limo had pulled up at Simpson's Rockingham home to take him to the airport and his business trip to Chicago. But the driver couldn't reach anyone on the intercom. While waiting, he saw a man walking across the property in the dark, heading for the house. He says, oh, it looks, looks like him now. I think I'll try it again. So he calls him. Simpson answers, yeah, I'm rushing around. I'll be right, I'll, get, I'll be down there in a few minutes. He comes down, closer to 11, They're running a little late. Uh, they're grabbing up bags. There's a small half moon shaped flight bag in the driveway. 
Cato says, here, let me get this for you. He says, no, don't touch that. You know, I don't want you. I'll take care of that. Says, OK. So they get about five pieces of luggage, they put it in the limo, and they take off. Now, more than an hour later, with O.J. Simpson boarding a flight for Chicago, a mysterious trail of bloody footprints will lead to the scene of the murder. June 12th, 1994, 11.45 p.m. Nicole Brown Simpson's neighbors come across a gruesome sight. Nicole's frantic Akita dog loose on the street, its feet covered in blood. The dog eventually leads the neighbors to the hacked up bodies of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson, already dead for more than an hour. I received a call at something before 3 a.m. at home from my lieutenant, John Rogers, uh, that they had a double, indicating a double homicide in the West LA area, and that was it. When I got there, the area was secured. In fact, all of Bundy Drive was blocked off and secured. We were given a brief walkthrough, shown the evidence. The blood was pointed out. The evidence was pointed out. This is a rage killing. These people weren't robbed. This isn't a dope hit. They're slashed and cut and one decapitated nearly. The next morning, I was in my classes at UCLA. And uh, during a break, I got a phone call the, from the manager of the restaurant saying that um, Ron hadn't shown up to work that morning. Half an hour after that, somebody I know called and said, have you seen the news? Um, these, Nicole Brown Simpson has been murdered, you know, in Brentwood with, with somebody else, with a guy. I thought, oh my god, Ron's been, Ron's been murdered, yeah. I walked out my door and I could hear the commotion. I got there probably maybe, maybe half an hour after they'd taken their bodies away, and um, I just, I was obviously visibly shaken. Gosh, I was in my studio in um, Culver City, and I got this call, and I couldn't believe it. I, I thought it was a dream, and it was just the most devastating thing in the world for me. I mean, to hear I cried and I cried, and it was just um, devastating. The following morning, O.J. Simpson was contacted in Chicago and returned on the next available flight. There was a wake. I didn't go to that. Um, and then on Thursday, it was her, you know, it was time to, to see her off. And it was very difficult. It was very difficult. Um, I, at one point, O.J. kind of came up and shook my hand and thanked me for being her friend. But it was very surreal to me because I started putting together what possibly the scenario could have been. And it was, it was very awkward and uncomfortable. And then the news was out. Simpson was charged with the double murder. In a bizarre attempt to avoid arrest, O.J. Simpson took off with his friend, A.C. Cowling, in his white Bronco, and the slow, iconic chase began on the California freeway. Simpson held a gun to his own head while the police, on a cell phone, convinced him to turn himself in. The nine-month trial aired everyone's dirty laundry. The juice was exposed as a vicious wife-beater. The LA Police Department, in turn, was accused by the defense of being racist and sloppy. In the end, the prosecution could not convince the jury that there was no reasonable doubt, and O.J. Simpson walked out a free man. However, the Browns and the Goldmans filed a civil suit against O.J. Simpson and won. He is yet to pay the $33 million in damages. The memory of Nicole Brown Simpson is forever preserved through a foundation dedicated to stopping the cycle of spousal abuse. She wasn't the battered woman that everybody knows, knows about her. She was alive and, and fun and, and funny. Oh my gosh, she was so funny.
I mean, she's just, she's just the sweetest, sweetest gal. And um, that's why it's so hard now, because I really miss her. Just vibrant and funny and beautiful and, and uh, not aware of her beauty that way. I mean, there wasn't a conceited bone in her body. Yeah, I miss the living daylights out of her. I, I miss that phone call. I miss uh, her voice. It's, uh, it's sad. But, you know, I cry because, yeah, I miss her. 